Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at In the Shadow of Tower Silver Axe. This is a adventure for Old School Essentials that was written and illustrated by Jacob Fleming. It's for low to mid-level adventurers for four or more players. This has a lot of great design in it and a couple points of improvement that I'll uh, point out to you, but it could be a really good starting point if you want to get your uh, fifth edition players into a more open world exploration style campaign for old school rules. Before we get started though, this episode is sponsored by The Dungeon Coach and his new book currently on Kickstarter, Alcander's Almanac of All Things. Alcander's Almanac is a modular 5e rule expansion that expands on the three core pillars of 5th edition D&D, combat, social encounters, and exploration, and truly lets you customize your game experience. The book is packed with new content like new martial actions, flanking rules, travel rules, expanded downtime options, social interaction mechanics, a reputation system, a crafting system, and tons more. Click the link in the description below to check it out for yourself on Kickstarter. Thanks to the Dungeon Coach for sponsoring, and now let's get back to the show. So the overall construction of this book is really good. It has a very nice, smooth matte cover, great print quality, and of course it is staple bound, which is my favorite format for uh, small-ish adventures because it's really easy to handle and it folds very flat when you are running the game. You can hold it in one hand. We have some information on the back here. It's a little bit of lore, kind of giving you a brief rundown as to the kind of adventure this is going to be. Inside the adventure, we have a little um, illustration right here. It's the same as the cover, but without the words. I really like it. If you want to frame it and put it on your mantelpiece, you can do that. I like how it shows a character in serious danger, which is a hallmark of old school play. In a lot of more recent uh, fifth edition type adventures, the characters look more like superheroes, at least that's the vibe that it's going for. Whereas here you see characters up against things that are much more powerful than them and looking quite scared and that is the right uh, vibe to be going for, I think. There is a map inside here as well that shows the Gem Throne Wilderness. This is gonna be the area that you will be exploring. This is an open world little module. Here we go. So we can see there's lots of different points of interest scattered around the map. You're gonna be able to visit all of these in whatever order the players choose to do and exploring them, looking for treasure, killing monsters and all that sort of thing. The main um, location here, the Tower of Shadows, is going to be the center of this labyrinth of shadows, which is a giant forest. But you can go around the outskirts exploring this stuff if you want to. It is a hex map. The hexes are a little bit hard to see. They're kind of faint, but you can see them scattered around here. I really like the uh, numbering system where you have the letters going down in columns, and then you have the numbers kind of going at a diagonal through here. So you can cross-reference uh, hexagons pretty quickly. So this one, for example, would be C on that column, and you go up this way, and it's five. So this would be C5. All of the roads here have the distance in miles uh, enumerated on them. Each little segment has that, which is really nice. It's a nice little detail. Um, it has a topographical kind of modern approach to the way that it draws the map, which is unusual for an old school adventure, but it gives a lot of detail and clarity so that you're going to be able to make rulings a bit more easily, I think. There's a lot of great little touches here. All of the hexes are six mile hexes, which is the best kind of hex, of course. All right, let's take a look at what we get inside the game. It does recommend that you don't give this map to players, but um, I think I'd be tempted to do that. Maybe they can just find it on another NPC or something, just so that right at the beginning of the game, they have more of a sense of what the environment looks like and the places that they can go. I'm in favor of giving players lots of information whenever possible. All right, so there's lots of illustrations throughout this book, which makes sense because the author is also an illustrator and I really like them. They're all done in this black uh, ink style and they, are, they show danger, they show peril, but they're also a little bit lighthearted, which I appreciate. Um, it, uh, illustrations that are just too dour and grim and get to you after a while and they don't really capture the feeling of playing in a D&D adventure. And I think this does that really well. Our table of contents right here. Uh, one nice thing about it is that all of the different locations you can explore, it has their uh, hex map locations right here on the side, which is a nice little bit of reference uh, to help you find stuff even quicker. There's a lot of thought that's been put into the layout of this that I like quite a bit. We have an introduction just talking to you about the general background. We have some bandits that invaded this lost and ruined tower in the center of the forest and they've taken it over. Their leader has turned into a powerful undead that you can deal with and his minions are all skeletons and zombies now. 
There's a lot of lost ruins and locations scattered around, created by the builders, a lost and mysterious ancient race, which are mostly now um, populated by elves who protect them. And there's a bunch of ruins that you can get into as well. We have factions here, the Silver Axe. This is the brigands and mercenaries that are now mostly undead. The elves, the dwarves, and uh, Golthek, um, which is a cyclopean, ogre-like race that you can also deal with that have their own distinct culture. Uh, how to get to the wilderness and some rumors that you might find here. The way that the rumors are designed where there's just some italicized bits and pieces where those bits are the untrue parts is a really nice little touch. It's very easy to read and um, it gives players a mix of truth and fiction that they can puzzle out for themselves. Travel considerations. This is an overland map, so you're going to have rules for traveling, um, how to hunt for stuff, encounters in the wilderness, weather, and so on. That's all going to be really important. There is a collecting element and a deciphering element to the whole world, which is nice. Uh, for example, there's these ancient statues. There's three of them. They have their hex locations listed right here. A nice touch. And each of these giant statues have these tablets on them. And if the players are smart and they copy down these tablets, eventually they're going to realize that there's a total of 26 symbols and you can turn it into a cipher key and translate other stuff in the environment. That's really nice. That's a nice bit of interaction. We have a city here that you can use as a home base, I suppose. Very simple, but very easy to read map. Um, I like the approach this takes to information design. Uh, everything is done on two page spreads. So there's a good, great uh, sense of control panel layout being used here. No flipping is really required. Everything you need is always right in front of you. Um, there is a definite vanilla tendency throughout most of the adventure where there isn't a lot of uh, deep weirdness that you tend to find in OSR stuff. It definitely fits more in this classic vanilla vein, which could be really good if you are a new player and you don't want too many weird surprises, or if you're a more experienced player and you really want to spice this up and add some more strangeness and add things that are a bit more memorable, it could be pretty easy to go in and just slap that on top of a lot of the environments and locations in this book. Uh, Amethyst Lake Ranch, a little ranch that you can um, explore. There's a dwarf with a troll problem. And these sorts of missions are very straightforward. Um, you go out, you find the troll, you kill him, you come back. Not a lot of weird twists to it. I think some more twists to some of these adventures would improve it a little bit. We have some of our locations you can explore. Lots of little mini dungeons. Uh, some of them have two levels. Every time we see a dungeon, we have the map on the same pages as the key to it, which makes things really easy to reference. Um, everything is done in these short little paragraphs. We have bolding to point out the important stuff. We have bullet points. Everything is extremely easy to skim. I love it. Uh, there isn't these big, dense paragraphs of text that you have to wade through and try and parse out what the players would know and what they wouldn't know. It's just really well done. A lot of very thoughtful information design. Some of these dungeons do have nice little twists to them. They're not huge, but sometimes there's little twists. Like for example, there could be a room where there's water dripping into it. And if you allow the room to fill up with water, then you're gonna be able to see hidden writing. If you say those words underwater, then cool stuff happens. Little twists like that. I think a lot of these dungeons could use more of that though. Just more interactivity. Uh, they're very easy to read and easy to run. But um, oftentimes it's pretty straightforward. You're going down a hallway, there's a trap there, maybe you fight a monster and then you get some treasure at the end. So there's this very simple loop where uh, some weird twists I think would make things a bit more memorable. Uh, lots of different varieties in terms of different kinds of dungeons. We have uh, vaults down here that you can explore. Again, love these illustrations, they're really great. They do a great job in selling the environment. The Labyrinth of Shadows, which is the huge forest in the center of the map. Uh, and you have a bunch of different locations you can run into there. There's an arcane well here, which you can poke at and it'll do random magical effects. That's really nice. Having stuff that players can poke and they're not sure what it's going to do is always great. Uh, even more of that would be even better. The magical effects are, they're basically just standard spells. So weirder stuff would, I think, be a bit more fun. And we have our main tower in the center of the map. This one has multiple levels that you can explore, random encounters, different types of monsters that can uh, show up. The floor plans do have variety, which is nice. That's gonna be fun to map as you go through it. Nice full page illustration right there. We also have some not underground segments uh, strictly, but uh, temple ruins. This one is a couple of pages long. 
we have a number of different giant statues that are scattered throughout the game that you can discover. And these often have these giant jewels in their heads, uh, which of course evokes the uh, advanced D&D player's guide. Uh, that's a lot of fun because players love climbing giant statues and pulling gems out of them, though of course sometimes they are trapped. Uh, if you kept, get these gems, then they are gonna be useful for unlocking other stuff. So it's nice to be able to get one thing that is useful somewhere else. because it encourages you to go back to locations you were at before. Uh, rundown of the Cyclopean ogre type creatures and their culture and how that works. That's great because that's gonna add some interesting player or NPC interaction. We have to figure out how the culture works and uh, react appropriately. We have an appendix here with some magic items, including some of these tablets and stone maps that you can unlock by doing things in the right order. You have this uh, code here, which you can read if you have deciphered the, uh, the cipher from looking at all of those statues that I mentioned before. We have some torn parchment maps. That's always great because players love handouts and a short bestiary at the back with our very dense old school essentials style stat blocks. How to read the giant um, hex crawl map and how to read dungeon maps. A replica of the big map in case you lose it. This one, actually, you can see the hexes much more clearly, which I appreciate. Um, oh, so this, actually, a slight uh, change here. I think what this is, this is the real complete map. The one that I showed you before is just called the player map, and it's actually missing a lot of these roads. So what that means is I think you really could give that handout map to your players. It's this one that it recommends you don't give to them because it just has all of these extra details that they can discover for themselves. I think that's a good balance and an open game license at the back. So overall, this is a really slick, really well-designed module. I, I like it quite a bit. The main thing that could be improved is more interactivity, more things for players to mess with, more, more ways that they could uh, grab the adventure by the horns and pull it in one direction or another. Uh, it's generally pretty straightforward, which is a plus or a minus depending on who you are. It could be a really good, um, format or a really good structure to build on. If you're a fairly new DM, you could use this as is and then just add tweaks to it to really make it your own. I think it's pretty ideal for that. Anyway, if this looks interesting to you, I'll put links down in the description for you can pick it up for yourself. And thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.